Yeah, so the main, the main message that I, want, that I want to give during this talk is that we can try also uh, study random geometry of different surfaces than the sphere. Uh, and I will mostly talk about bijections, uh, which are a crucial tool to understand uh, geometry of large maps. Um, so let me start from the definition of, of a map. Uh, so in this talk, um, a map is, uh, is a graph which is embedded uh, into a surface, but it's very important. <laughs> it's very important here uh, that uh, that the surface uh, is is an arbitrary, uh, real, two-dimensional, connected, uh, compact manifold without the boundary. Uh, so it can be uh, orientable, it can be non-orientable, and in it can have uh, arbitrary genus. So we have these two examples of, of a map. So the first map is a map uh, on the projective plane. So, uh, so this, this blue surface is the projective plane if you identify these points here on the boundary the way these arrows shows you, which means that this point and this point are the same. So you glue them together and then this surface is the projective plane and, and this graph is a map the projective plane. And here we have a standard uh, map on the torus. And uh, mm, strictly from the definition, you can also think about uh, maps more combinatorially, which is sometimes convenient uh, to show something. Uh, namely, you can think that this is a collection of polygons uh, which are glued together, such that the boundary uh, is the embedding of, of the graph. So for instance, the representation of this map uh, is, is, is here, so it's just a two gone, and if you glue this side with this side in a way that, that these two arrows are glued like that, then you obtain precisely this map. And here you have a standard way of, of building uh, a torus from, from a quadrangle, so you just glue the opposite edge. Um, and in my talk, uh, I will always uh, work with rooted maps. So this concept was already uh, introduced earlier. Uh, so it, it's much more convenient to work with rooted maps which when you're interested in enumeration because uh, rooting means that you don't have to worry about automorphism. So it's killing all, all, the, all the automorphies of your map. Um, and the way I see rooting is by distinguishing and orienting a corner in your map. So it's a bit different when, when, what, you, what you saw today earlier. So uh, in, the orient, in the oriented case, uh, quite often you just uh, distinguish one edge and you orient this edge. But this is not enough when, when your surface is non-oriented. So you also need to say which side is on your left, which side is on your right, if your surface is non-oriented. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> this? <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So, so one of the most natural questions in, in this business, if you're a combinatorialist, is what is the number of, of, this, of this guy? So what is the number of maps with n edges on a given surface? Uh, so this is a question that was studied uh, by Tat in, in, in the 60s when he actually initiated studying combinatorial maps. And he found this beautiful formula uh, for the number of, of planar maps. So maps uh, on the surface, or on the sphere. Um, and more than 25 years later, the general answer was given for, for arbitrary surface. So this is just an asymptotic, uh, asymptotic answer. But, uh, but asymptotically, this is, this is the number of maps with n edges on a given, uh, on a given surface. Uh, so, so in fact, if, you're, if your surface is orientable, uh, th this is some kind of universal pattern. Uh, so, so you can observe it, for instance, using the topological recursion that, that this kind of behavior is, is very common for many, many models. Uh, but but this, 
this result of Bender and Confield, it, it works also for non-orientable maps. So it actually it doesn't depend on orientability or, or not. Um, and and it's, very, it's very interesting to, to find a, a direct explanation of this formula of that, uh, because his original proof was, was not so direct. Uh, so, so this, if you, I mean, if you look at this formula, you can see that here you have a Catalan number times 2 times 3 to n divided by n plus 2. So, so you, might, you might guess that it should be related with counting trees, rooted trees, uh, which is given by the Catalan number, with, with some additional information. Uh, and in fact, this is, this is the case. So, uh, so this, this path was took by Corian and Vacan in, in 81, who were able to, to prove this formula uh, directly by giving a bijection between maps and labeled trees. And in the 90s, uh, Gilles Schaeffer, he, um, he was working on Cory uh, by bijection and he, um, he rephrased it a bit differently, but he also found another bijection uh, with a different tree-like structure. So these are called balanced blossoming trees. Um, and you will see soon that in fact, there are many, many bijections. So these bijections are uh, understood in a, in a wide generality, but, but most of these bijections are either labeled tree objects or blossoming tree objects. Uh, so, so, okay, so, so these guys, they're just uh, rooted uh, trees, uh, which carry some labels on vertices, and these are positive labels, and, uh, and they have a property that the root vertex is labeled by one, and along edges, the difference of labels is, is at most one. So these are, these are well-labeled trees, and they're in a bijection with, with maps. And what are balanced blossoming trees? So these are binary uh, rooted trees. And each vertex has an additional half edge. So this, this half edge is represented as, as this little arrow. It's called a bat. Um, and there is this balanced condition. So this, this balanced condition is telling you that if you walk around your tree, starting from the root, and whenever you see a bud and a leaf, you're closing it. Okay, so you're doing this, and you're, you, keep, you keep traveling. Uh, and when you finish, there will be two leaves. And, and this balance condition requires that one of these leaves is a rooted leaf, is a root leaf. So this is the definition of, of balanced blossoming trees. And both these bijections, they, uh, they explain this, this formula of that. So the initial, in, initial motivation of studying this bijection was to basically to, to understand these objects a bit better and uh, explain this nice enumerative results. Uh, another thing is that uh, maps are quite complicated and trees are very easy objects. So, so also, if you, if you know that there is a bijection with trees, uh, it might be very useful to generate maps. Um, so, let me explain how these bijections work. Uh, so the first observation uh, is that instead of counting maps with n edges, uh, you can actually count quadrangulations, bipartite quadrangulations with n faces. Uh, so this is, a, this is a theorem which works for arbitrary surface. So, so again, it doesn't have to be sphere. It can be non-orientable. It's a, it's a very general result, and, and this bijection is, is quite easy. So uh, what you need to do, if you start from, from a map and you want to associate the bipartite quadrangulation, uh, you're just looking at, at faces in your map. You place a new uh, vertex inside each face, and then you connect every corner inside the face to the vertex that you, uh, that you put inside. So if you do this and you forget the old edges, what you get is precisely a bipartite quadrangulation. And it can be easily seen that, that this procedure is in invertible, so, so it gives you a bijection. Uh, and okay, and if you, if you are dealing with rooted objects, there is always a canonical way to root 
the associated object. So, so it also works on the level of rooted object. Uh, so the moral is that instead of counting maps with n edges, we can count bipartite quadrangulations. And it will be the same. It will have no, just, uh, I'm a bit confused by your uh, convention for uh, identifying boundaries. When do you, when do you have a, a common fit and uh, uh, here in your example for Yes. The left hand side and the right hand side are uh, put together. Uh, let me see. So, okay, so, so basically these two edges sh should be glued without a twist, and this, these two edges should be glued with a twist. Um, it was not apparent to me in the map before. So, so, so this means that this, this edge is the same as this one, and this edge is the same Wait, as this one. The map, the map? Yes. Uh, I'm confused by the, you didn't draw the edge straight. That means that. So, so, so this edge, so if you walk like that, no, you're no, going no, here. Left, uh, ah, so, so this edge, edge is this edge, okay. and this edge okay. is this edge. Okay, okay, um, okay. Okay, so yeah, so the moral is that instead of, instead of counting maps with an edges, we can count bipartite quadrangulations with n phases and the, the result will be the same. So, so this was the, the main idea of, of these bijections. So let me show you how these bijections work and I will start from, from a labeled uh, bijection. So this is a, a well-labeled tree and if you want to, to associate the quadrangulation, what you do is the following. So first of all, you add a new vertex, you label it by zero, and then you walk around your tree and you connect every corner one to your vertex zero, okay? So you do this, you keep walking, and when you finish, all the corners with label one are connected to, to vertex zero. Now you do exactly the same thing with vertices labeled by two and one. So in general, you use this local rule that you're always connecting a corner i to the first corner with label i minus one walking around your tree. And that's it. So this is how this bijection works. Uh, so when you do this, the object that you generate is a, is a quadrangulation. Um, and if you want to go back, you need to use this local rule. So uh, if you start from a quadrangulation, you put some labels on vertices, and these labels are precisely the distances from the root vertex. So the root vertex has label zero, and then you put the labels which are giving you the, the distance, the graph distance, and then every face looks either like that or like that. So then inside each face, you just draw this red edge, and the, the theorem tells you that this is. The, the, the inversion of this bijection. So this is how you, how you produce uh, a well-labeled tree from a given quadrangulation. Um, and one very important observation here is that these labels, so labels in your well-labeled well tree, they're corresponding to, to the metric structure of your quadrangulation. So, so when you're looking at, at these trees and the labels of these trees, they're telling you precisely what is the uh, what is the metric structure of the initial quadrangulation? Um, and the blossoming, the, the bijection with blossoming tree, I, I already showed you more or less how it works. So, so you do this closing operation, okay? Uh, so, so when you close your map, you obtain a map which is four-valent. Va four so this is a dual map of a quadrangulation. So, um, so, so, in fact, this is not really a bijection of quadrangulations, but with a dual object. But by duality, of course, you have a bijection with quadrangulation. And this is a bijection because of the, of the following theorem. So, it turns out that there is a way to, to orient uh, the, the edges uh, of, the, of this spanning tree that was here, such that, and it's a canonical way, such that this orientation doesn't have a clockwise circuit. 
And this orientation is also Eulerian, which means that the number of, of uh, the, that the in degree and out degree of every vertex is exactly the same. Uh, so there is a theorem that there exists a unique uh, Eulerian orientation which has this property. So in fact, you can forget about this orientation because it's uniquely associated with your, with your map. And, and that's why, why it's, a, it's a bijection, more or less. Uh, and again, we have the same observation. So, so metric structure in this quadrangulation, it can, again, it can be encoded by this blossoming tree. Uh, and how does it work? Uh, it works in the following way. So there is this corner uh, labeling, uh, which works like that. You put label zero in, in the root corner, and then when you walk around your tree, uh, you just put new labels by this local rule. So whenever you see a leaf, you uh, decrease your label, and whenever you see a bud, you increase your label. And these labels, they correspond to, uh, to distances in your quadrangulation. Uh, so, so the moral of this story is that we have a better motivation to study these bijections. So we already know that, that these bijections, they were telling us something about the structure of our map, and they explained uh, nice enumerative results, but in fact they are giving you much more. So they are telling you something about, about the metric structure of your map. So it turned out that, that they were a very crucial tool in studying a random map. So there is the famous Brownian map of, of uh, Legal and Mirmont, uh, which seems to be the universal object uh, in, in this random geometry, it was proved that indeed for many, many models, it is the universal model. And the crucial tool were this, this type of bijections. So, uh, so labeled bijections, they were generalized. Um, and also blossoming type bijections, they were generalized by many, many people. Many of, of them are here. I'm sure this list is not exhaustive, so you can complain later, and then I can add you here. Uh, but I think that already it's a pretty good uh, motivation to, to asking, uh, is it possible to, to have similar projections for other surfaces than, than the sphere? Because if yes, that would be a very good, uh, very good starting point for, for studying random geometry of other surfaces. Um, okay, so let me start from uh, telling you what is the situation in the labeled tree-like structures. Uh, so, so first of all, um, in the orientable case, it was actually uh, it was noticed by Marcus and Schaeffer that that Schaeffer's bijection and Cory Vaclin bijection and then re redefined by Schaeffer it works precisely the same for for any orientable surface. Uh, we just need to have a good analog of, of labeled trees. So trees are maps which have precisely one face on the sphere, and that's, that's what you need for other surfaces. So, so okay, this is just a repetition of, of the definition I already showed you. So I will be interested in, in maps which have only one face, uh, and they are labeled, which means that uh, that the difference between labels along the edge is at most one, but, but labels can be negative, uh, and well labeled uh, if all the labels are positive. Um, so, so this is a theorem of, of Marcus and Schaeffer that quadrangulations on any orientable surface and rooted one face well labeled maps. Um, so, okay, so I already told you this construction look, looks precisely the same, so I will try to be quick. So you start from a quadrangulation, you label your vertices by the distance from the root vertex, and then you know that all the faces, they, they, they look like that. You have your global orientation, because it's an orientable surfaces, so you know what does it mean to, to be clockwise or counterclockwise. So, so you can just use exact same convention as, as for the sphere. And everything works perfectly. So, so theorem says that when you do this, the map that you obtain is a well-labeled one-face map. And moreover, this is a bijection. So you can invert it. 
Um, okay. So what about non-orientable surfaces? Uh, I mean, you can see that it clearly depends, this construction clearly depends on, on the fact that we have this global orientation and we can canonically, uh, we can canonically do this procedure. Uh, so, so for non-orientable maps, it's actually not clear if, if we can, can extend it. Uh, but it's, it turned out that this is possible. So in fact, this theorem holds for any surface, for any non-oriented surface. Um, and more, moreover, this theorem also works in a way that if you restrict to orientable surfaces, you obtain the same construction that was just described. So, so what is the idea uh, of extending this? So okay, first of all, we want that if you restrict to orientable case, it's exactly the same. So this simply means that the local, local rules, they have to be the same. So locally, we need to, we need to see this picture. Um, and okay, and the second thing is that we want to produce a unicellular map, which means map which has precisely one phase. So what does it mean? Well, it means that if we, if we draw this dual graph, the blue graph, so this graph needs to have a particular structure because if it, if it has only one phase, this basically means that this graph should be more or less contractible. So it should, it should look like a tree. Uh, so that's, that's the main idea. So what we did, instead of, instead of drawing these red edges, we were trying to, to build this blue graph so that locally it looks like that. Uh, and okay, because, because the position of this blue and black edges, they forces the position of red edges. So we know that locally everything looks fine. Um, and, and we only have to be sure that, that this construction is invertible. So the way we construct this blue graph has to be in, in some way local. I mean, we, we should be always able to, to go back. Uh, so, okay, so this is a very, very general idea of, of what to do so that it works, but, but then you can, you can really make it work. Um, and this is, this is uh, how this bijection works, more or less. Um, okay, and, and one thing is that uh, when you want to do... Yes? Uh, you don't have to go into detail, but do you mean that you, you, have a, you are constructing locally the orientation? Of the Precisely, so exactly. So the way we are building this, this blue graph um, so you can think about it that we are somehow exploring our quadrangulation. And we are starting from very close to the root, and then we are walking farther and farther and farther. And, and depending on what we already built, we can somehow go farther and farther recursively. So, you start from the root and then so we start from the root, and then we build our blue graph. Yes. Um, yes. So. So it's actually more convenient to have a, to have a bijection between pointed objects, not, not just rooted, but also pointed. By pointed, I mean that we distinguish one vertex. Uh, and this is, this is very important for doing enumeration because when you have pointed objects, then you don't have this constraint that all the labels are positive, uh, which is a bit annoying when you're trying to enumerate things. Uh, so when they, when they are negative, it's much easier to, to, uh, to do enumeration. But also when you're trying to understand uh, this metric of, of your quadrangulation, it's also good to have a bijection where, where you just point any, any vertex you like. Uh, so we were able to deduce this bijection, this pointed bijection, um, but, but we didn't have a very explicit construction. We, we, we used some kind of trick that that we built several bijections and using Hall's marriage theorem, we were able to prove that there exists a bijection. Um, okay, and this is the only slide where, where, where I'm talking about random things. Uh, so it's a little bit technical, but, but what is important here is the following thing. So one of the first results and crucial results to do this um, uh, to, to, to study uh, the convergence to, to, to the Brownian sphere was that first you had to know what is the typical size of your, of your map. Uh, and it was, n to one, it was n to the exponent 1 divided by 4. So, so the moral of this slide is that with our bijection we can prove that this is not sphere-specific. It's true for any surface. So 
what we are saying here basically is that if you, if you want to understand what is a, a typical radius of your map, uh, what is a profile of distances, it is of order n to 1 divided by 4. So it's exactly the same as, as on the sphere. So this is like a first result which suggests that everything that you are doing on the sphere might be possible to, to do on other surfaces. Um, okay, and then this, this bijection was generalized uh, by, by Jehami. Uh, so what Jehami did, he, um, he, he rephrased this language of dual expression graph. So, so I told you that we were using this blue graph, which was exploring uh, your, your surface, and Jeremy used a different uh, language. So he defined something which is called the level loops, and it has two very nice consequences. So first of all, he was able to construct this bijection with pointed objects directly. So we did, he, he, he was not using uh, tricks like we, like we did. Uh, but also he, he was able actually to extend it to arbitrary uh, bipartite maps. And in fact, even non-bipartite, but this is, this is quite technical. Uh, so what he did, you can, if you know, uh, uh, Boutier de Francesco Guitard bijection, you can think that what Jeremy did is like an arbitrary surface generalization of, of this, this bijection. Um, and one application of this is a, is, is a direct enumeration of, triangulation, of triangulations on any non-oriented surface. Um, so one, one very non-oriented surface specific thing here is that uh, when you have an arbitrary bipartite map, not necessarily quadrangulation, uh, then the g like how this label of these mobiles look like is actually very difficult to control because it's not local. It actually depends on, 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 your, whole, on your whole map. So this is why there is this small miracle that for quadrangulations and for triangulations, we can do enumeration be because your constraints are actually local. But this, these are only two models where you can really, where you can really apply these bijections to, to, to understand enumeration directly. Um, so, so this also motivates to, to understand blossoming bijections because hopefully these blossoming bijections will behave slightly better. And it turned out that actually it is the case. Uh, so, so let me first tell you about orientable case. Uh, so th this is already a very different situation than the situation with labeled objects because uh, it was known from the beginning that orientable higher genus uh, labeled objects behave exactly the same as planar. But it was not the case for, for blossoming bijection. So it was, it was open for, for very long to extend uh, Schaeffer's construction to higher genus surfaces. And it was done by, by Matthias Lepoutre um, in 17. Uh, and one of, one of the observations that he did is that um, instead of working with Eulerian maps, in higher genus you should work with bicolorable maps. Because in the planar case, these two notions are the same. But this is no longer uh, true when you look at other surfaces. Um, so, but then he, he basically used kind of similar ideas uh, uh, related with the fact that the set of orientations is a lattice, so it has a minimal element, and then you can, then you can uh, describe this minimal element using clockwise or counterclockwise circuits. So this worked pretty well for orientable surfaces. The problem is that clockwise and counterclockwise circuits, it's uh, something which, which is not well defined on non-oriented surface. Uh, so we, we need to understand it slightly differently. Uh, and the main idea here is that you can create this blossoming object using certain canonical spanning trees. Um, so this was one important ingredient. And the second important ingredient was also that we had to define these blossoming maps in a, in a correct way. So uh, there is not like a unique uh, canonical generalization of blossoming trees to higher genus surfaces, so you somehow have to figure out what are the right properties uh, of, of these objects on higher genus surfaces. Um, you, you, you define what is a bicolorable orientation? Um, okay, so, um, no. <laughs> so, 
on earlier, or, so a quick reminder that Euler orientation is an orientation set that such that in degree and out degree of all the vertices are the same. And bicolorable orientation is, uh, is an orientation such that uh, if you go to a dual picture, it's, it's actually, it's, we will not use it, so this is not that important, but, but quickly saying, so if you go to a dual picture and you look on the orientation of the dual picture, so the dual picture is a bipartite map, so you want to have that every cycle is, is uh, bipartite. Is that right? Uh, Do you want to run the brief space to have as many edges in one direction? No, c c c sorry. No, 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 no. Okay, thank you, Marie. Um, okay, so, so, so what is the definition of, of a blossoming map? Uh, so, okay, so first of all, it's a map which has these two, two additional half edges uh, that we call buds and leaves. So they are, they are depicted by, by these two little arrows. Uh, so it looks pretty much the same as, as previously. And we will again use this corner labeling as, as previously. Uh, to define uh, this balanced condition that, that, that in the planar case I was just saying that at the end you have these two leaves and, and the root leaf is the one that was not closed. Uh, in arbitrary surface, uh, this condition is a bit different. So what we do, we, we define this, this, corner, this corner labeling. So I remind quickly that, that it's given by this local rule that whenever I, so I put zero for the root corner, I traverse, and whenever I see a bot, I increase by one, and whenever I see uh, a, a leaf, I decrease by one. Uh, so when you do this, uh, you want that the following condition is satisfied. So whenever you have an edge, the first site that you visit of this edge, let's say that it has labeled I plus one, then you want that the second site, second visited site of this edge has labeled I. So this is, this is our condition. And so every map uh, which satisfies this condition is, is called a well-blossoming well map. And it has, it has one phase. Um, so okay, so here is, here is an example. So okay, if I, if I start walking from here, this site has labeled one. So this means that, that I need this site to have label zero. If this is a well, uh, if, if this is a well blossoming map, and the same with this edge, and the same with this edge. So I, I, I didn't, I didn't say, but I'm, I'm gluing these opposite, uh, these opposite sides. Um, and here is our theorem. So the theorem says that there is a bijection between bipartite pointed maps on on any surface. So it can be non-oriented and between well-blossoming maps on the same surface. Um, and all the, all the relevant statistics are, are transferred. So for instance, you can control the number of black vertices, the number of white vertices, and phase degrees. Uh, and additionally, the distances from the distinguished point, they correspond to this, to this corner labeling. Um, OK. So, so how does it work? How this bijection works? So I start from, from a pointed quadrangulation. So this is a, this is a quadrangulation which is drawn on, on a surface. I actually, I, I really don't care right now if this surface is orientable or not because I will not need it to, to explain the bijection. But these arrows here, they, they tell you how to glue the boundary of, of, this, of this polygon to obtain a surface. This surface will be non-orientable, actually. So, so, okay, so I have a quadrangulation, it's pointed, so the, the pointed vertex is red, and then, uh, oh, sorry. And then what you do, you do, it, you do a standard thing, so you put labels, which are telling you what are the distances in your quadrangulation, uh, 
And then there is this lemma which tells you that there is, there is a unique geodesic tree. So what is a geodesic tree? Uh, there is a, a unique geodesic tree which is, which is maximal in some sense. So what is a geodesic tree? This is a spanning tree of your graph which has a property that the distances to the pointed vertex in this tree are the same as the distances in, in your whole map. So this is what we call the geodesic tree and and okay, and then you look on the set of all these geodesic trees, and, and there is a unique a maximal geodesic tree whose contour word is maximal in lexicographic order. Uh, but the good thing is that this tree you can you can find it very easily. So there is a very easy algorithm to find this tree, uh, and this algorithm is more or less just a breadth-first search. So it's, a, it's a small variant of breadth first, first search, but it's a very easy algorithm to find this tree. So what do you do? You find this tree, and then, and then you, you draw the dual map of your quadrangulation. So, okay, so, so it's a huge mess right now here, uh, but, but, I, but I'm going to remove some of the edges that the picture will look a bit better. So when you draw, when, when, when you draw this uh, dual map, then you are not interested in, in these blue edges, so you only, you're only interested in, in your spanning tree, so you can remove these blue edges. And, uh, and this picture has this property that every edge of your spanning tree, it cuts precisely one edge of your, of your dual map. So if you now replace these edges by dotted ed edges, I can also actually forget uh, my spanning tree. And this is almost the end. I mean, it's now you can, you can just finish drawing your blossoming map. So what you do, you just start walking ara around your map, starting from the root vertex. And whenever you see an edge which looks like that, it means that this edge should be cut. So I cut it. Uh, and, and I'm always traversing from a face which has label I to a face which has labeled either i plus one or i minus one. And I'm using this local rule to, 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 uh, to decide whether this will be a bot and this will be your leaf or, or the other way around. So here, for instance, I traverse from two to three. So this has to be a bot. This is a leaf. And I'm continue traveling. So, OK, so this means that I'm traveling here and here. And now there is this edge that I have to cut. And I do the same, okay? So now I, I went from three, uh, sorry, from two to three. So this is a bat and this is a leaf, and I continue, okay? So here I, I am here, and I go from three to four, and so on. So when you finish, uh, you obtain precisely the blossoming, the well blossoming map. And the theorem says that this is, in fact, a bijection. Um, OK. So uh, this is a construction which works on any surface. It doesn't require orientability, and it covers what was known for orientable surfaces. So let me just quickly uh, show you some enumerative consequences of, this, of these bijections. Uh, so, so the first, the first uh, consequence is, uh, is a combinatorial explanation of this, of this theorem of Bender and Canfield, which tells you that uh, the generating function of uh, quadrangulations, of bipartite quadrangulations, has a specific form. Uh, so it tells you that, that if you look at the, at the generating function of bipartite quadrangulations on any surface S, then this is always a rational function in, in this power series U, where u is given by, by the system of, this, of these two equations. Uh, so, so this can be, under, can be understood thanks to the labeled bijection. Um, but if you restrict to orientable surfaces, then in fact you have a much stronger result. Uh, so, so then, actually, this, the same generating function is rational function in square root of 1 minus 12t. But this is something much stronger, uh, and a direct combinatorial explanation of this was given by Leputre by, by building his uh, higher genus blossoming 
bijection for orientable surfaces. Uh, but this is also a consequence of the topological recursion. Um, and we can already see here that, that there are some differences between orientable and non-orientable maps from a numerative point of view. So I, I started by saying that, in fact, maybe, maybe it's the same and we can study random maps of, of, of any surface. But, but from a numerative point of view, actually, this, these two things are not always the same. Sometimes there are some strong differences. Um, and finally, there is this, um, it's quite technical, but but this is a theorem which was in orientable setting. It was proved by Bender, Confit, and Richmond in, in 93 and, uh, and for, for any surfaces by Ach and Giorgetti. Uh, and the difference is now that, that we have a bivariate uh, generating function. So this function is telling you what is the number of black vertices and what is the number of white vertices in your, in your quadrangulation. So if you study this function, then there is the structural result about, about it. And here again, there is a very big difference between orientable and non-orientable surfaces. So let, let me quickly comment what's happening when your surface is orientable. So when it's orientable, then degree of this polynomial, so this is a polynomial in t black dot, t white dot, and a. But if your surface is orientable, then, the, then this is just a polynomial in t black dot and t white dot. There is no a variable there. Uh, and also this exponent, 4 minus 5 times Euler characteristic, is always an even integer. So in particular, this means that in the orientable case, this function is always a rational function in t black dot, t white dot. And this is not true for non-orientable surfaces. Uh, so for non-orientable surfaces, it's, it's a bit more complicated. Um, and this, and this label uh, this blossoming type bijection in an orientable case it gives you a combinatorial explanation of this theorem and this is a work of Marie and Matthias um, and in the general setting uh, we can also use it to, to recover this theorem uh, so, so, so that's it just a very small summary so I hope that uh, the main message here was to show you that in fact all the all the tools that you need, a priori, you need to study random uh, geometry. So if you're interested, what is behavior of big random quadrangulations on, on, on your favorite surface? So all the tools a priori exist. So this is, this is supposed to be an invitation because there are many experts here in, uh, in probability to, to start looking at, at random uh, surfaces uh, different than the sphere. So thank you very much.